Last weekend, I helped to lead a retreat for teens, uh, ages 13 to 18. It was down uh, in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And pr- this talk really came out of that experience. And uh, the weekend was one of, as we do here, practicing mindfulness, practicing presence. And um, so they brought the mindfulness also into movement. And then we'd go into small groups where then they'd practice staying present and, and sharing with each other some of their experiences and listening, holding a space for each other. And the depth of the sharing was quite beautiful. Uh, real taking that risk to to speak of the real struggles in in their lives whether it was loneliness or you know their body image addictive behaviors feelings of of depression or stress and and the safety that in that presence they held for each other um, really really influenced me i was just very touched by the power of the kind of community that these teens developed just just in a weekend, a sense of, of real safety and care amongst the whole group. So I, I was particularly, in a way, touched by, you know, it's, we're in this season right now where it's so obvious that in our culture, in, this, in the kind of political, adversarial uh, tone, all the spin, all the hype, that um, it's, it's all presentation. And the contrast of being with a group of people that were young and so undefended. I think that's what hit me, that there was just the layers of defensiveness had not caked on, the persona and the presentation uh, had not hardened. And uh, it was quite, quite powerful to see. So as I mentioned, the contrast for me last week with all the debates and everything and then going and being with teens who are just themselves, the realness, the courage to be real. And also the contrast, I think, that many of us probably feel and know in our own how our daily habits get kind of locked in in a way and we have our own, our own style of um, presentation of being somebody and of trying to prove something or the little fabrications, the little manipulations, our own defendedness. So I was moved by this power, uh, the possibility of letting down armor and what can happen when we do. What can happen when we take the chance to be less defended? And I wanted to share, uh, because it reminded me when I got back, a story I read many years ago that Pema Chodron talked about uh, how a 15-year-old Hispanic boy was brought, his mother had asked that he attend, he was from uh, L.A., and he was was involved with gangs, and he had a real attitude, you know, kind of a chip on his shoulder and a swagger and a sneer and so on. And his mom was hoping to kind of get him out of the violence of gang life. And so she asked that he go to Boulder and be part of a gathering uh, Chogyam Trungpa held in the Rocky Mountains. Give him a summer there, you know. And so uh, the hope was that he really, it would give him a little bit of a, a shift, a different attitude. And the people that he was staying with were loosely affiliated with the Buddhist community. So it was a culture shock, I'd say. You know? <laughs> so here's what happened. One day he came to an event where Chogyam Trungpa was, uh, was there. And at the end of the event, Chogyam Trungpa sang the Shambhala anthem. Now, this is what Pema Chodron writes. She says, this was an awful experience for the rest of us because for some reason he loved to sing the Shambhala anthem in a high-pitched, squeaky, and cracked voice. <laughs> this event was outside, and he sang into a microphone, and the sound traveled for miles across the plains. <laughs> and in the midst of it, Juan, this 15-year-old, broke down and started crying. Everyone else was just feeling awkward or embarrassed, but Juan just started to cry. Later he said he cried because he had never seen anyone that brave. He said, that guy, he's not afraid to be a fool. He's not afraid to be a fool. 
that turned out to be a major turning point in his life because he realized he didn't have to be afraid to be a fool either. All that persona and chip on the shoulder were guarding his soft spot and he could let them go. And because he was so sharp and bright, he got the message. His life did turn around and now he's got his education. He's back in L.A. helping kids. So we get this sense that um, we might not have quite the exaggerated persona he came to Boulder with, but there's this way that we're covering up so we don't appear a fool or appear whatever it is we don't want to appear. And that the pathway, and I felt the teens were just so beautiful at showing that, is to be willing to expose that vulnerability, that soft spot, which really is the pathway into our aliveness and our compassion and our hearts. So I often think of the spiritual path as as we're not trying to become somebody more. We're not trying to add anything, add some shine in any way. We're actually undoing the trappings, undoing all that personhood and all the defenses and all the strategies that block who we are. It's an undoing. And in the most basic way, we're letting go of whatever we're holding on to that hides who we are and that stops us from loving, and stops us from being true to ourselves. And the practice really is through presence. Presence disarms us. We're here, we're listening, we're involved in these practices of mindfulness in some deep way to disarm, to uncover, to come back home to a kind of purity or innocence, because that was what I was feeling this weekend. There's an innocence that comes through. And we get jaded. We don't feel it in ourselves because we're so used to walking around with the armoring. So what I'd like to do in this class, and then we can follow up next week because I I realize it's it's a subject that's broad and it brings up a lot of questions. So if there's questions, uh, we can explore them together at the next class. But what I'd like to do tonight is explore a bit of how come it's so hard to disarm, to be less defended, okay? And and I'd also like to explore what helps us to take the chance, because it feels like taking a chance. We're always playing our edge on this path in a way. What helps us to take the chance and a little bit to touch into to the blessings of um, an undefended heart. So um, one thing to consider as we explore, because I'll be describing more what I mean by um, our defendedness, how we, um, st- how we don't let the truth of who we are out. We cover up. We pretend. So I'm going to be naming that more. And I'm asking you to examine for yourself your own sense of your level of truthfulness. Now, in a deep way, it's truthfulness with yourself. It always comes down to that. But tonight we're going to be emphasizing that truthfulness with each other. And I'd like to invite you to look at that without judgment, with really uh, the spirit of curiosity. Just, it, just see it. So just to begin with, the research is done. There's been a lot of research on the art of deception and self-deception. And want, you know, just to pull out one, one piece of research in uh, one one set up in one field experiment, researchers had strangers get together and talk to each other for 10 minutes, and they recorded the conversation. And then afterwards, they told, you know, they asked them how honest they felt they had been, and subjects reported feeling that they felt completely honest and accurate in that 10-minute conversation. But then they played the tape, and as they listened to it, they, they were able to identify where they had steered away from the truth. And they did it in 10 minutes, an average of almost three times, three falsehoods in 10 minutes. That's a lot. Just 10 minutes? <laughs> three lies? So 
it's actually 2.92 false things that they told, just to, just to say it exactly. It's reflexive and unconscious, the amount we lie. And I can say for myself that, as, as, as I've described before, whenever I'm reflecting on a topic, I really apply it to myself and, and watch myself. And I was once again really surprised and not pleased with the degree to which I found myself tossing in little things that I'd say, why did I say that? That wasn't really exactly right. But I'll get back to that. (laughs) I will. I confess. I like to. (laughs) The, The basic point that I'll be making is that we are always trying to make an impression. In some way, we move through the world trying to control how others perceive us and how others perceive things. And we try to control people, other people's perceptions so that we can convince them to like us or to be interested in us or else to buy something or else to vote a certain way. I mean, this is just, this is the way we try to control life is to control people's perceptions. And sometimes it's done as a living. In one story, there's a magician who's working on a cruise ship and He has a parrot who's always ruining his act. You know, he's always saying, you know, in the middle of the trick, the card's up his sleeve, or he's got a dove in his pocket, or he slipped it through the hole in his hat, you know. So one day the ship sank, and the parrot and the magician found themselves together on a life raft. And um, for several days, the parrot's sitting silent. He's just staring at the magician. And then finally, the fourth day, the parrot says, okay, I give up. What'd you do with the ship? (laughs) (laughs) So not only do we try to create impressions, people are inclined to believe the impression. In fact, the way the brain goes, and this is part of cognitive science, is that we believe things before we disbelieve things. So you can put out a, a mistruth, and it gets in there in the brain, it takes work to undo it. So it sticks, even though it's not true. So let's look a bit at the root of our impulse to control others' perceptions. Okay, and it comes, as as you might imagine, it comes from a limited and insecure self-perception. That when we, I mean, we each come into this world, we each and every organism has a sense of separateness. And as humans, we develop a small self-identity. We develop this egoic identity. And what happens is this is a story that grows about who we are and our importance or lack of importance and our flaws and our virtues and so on. And with any egoic story, with any self-identity, hand in hand, we have a toolkit on how to protect it. If there's a sense of self, there's also a toolkit on how to protect that self. It's in our nervous system. We know the basic ingredients are fight, flight, and freeze. And the ingredient we're going to talk about tonight, the component of that toolkit that's very central, it's not just us, it's to the whole animal kingdom, is deception. In other words, we use deception, we use creating impressions in order to protect our self-identity. Because inherently, it feels insecure. If we feel separate, we feel like we need something that we don't have and that others could in some way hurt us. It feels real like that. So we have to protect. So we do it by misrepresentation and we modulate our behaviors in order to try to get what we want and avoid what we don't want, which includes uh, ways that we cooperate or try to meet expectations and, and put ourselves into shapes and forms that really aren't the truth of who we are. We try to meet expectations in order to get approval. We're untrue to ourselves. Another parrot story, okay, since I'm on a parrot (laughs) roll. This guy gets a parrot for his birthday, but this parrot is full-grown. He's got a really bad attitude, and he's 
he's just, he curses all the time, okay? So the vocabulary is really bad. And um, he's also very rude. And so this guy tries to change the bird's attitude in all sorts of ways. He, he speaks to him politely and he plays really nice music and he does a lot of meditation yoga around him and so on, but nothing works. So finally he yells at the bird and it gets, and it gets worse. You know, he shakes the bird and the bird gets madder and ruder. So it's, they're in bad shape. Finally, in a moment of desperation, this guy takes the parrot and puts him in the freezer. Okay. <laughs> All right, so then there's all this, the birds squawking and kicking and screaming, and then suddenly, all's quiet. The guy gets frightened that he might have actually hurt the bird and quickly opens the freezer door. The parrot calmly steps out onto his extended arm and says, I'm so sorry that I offended you with my language and actions. I do ask for your forgiveness. I will try to check my behavior. Guy's astonished at this quick change in attitude. I was about to ask what changed him when the parrot continued, may I ask what the chicken did? So we know that we enter this world and actually the more we encounter a difficult world, a hostile world, the more we conform our behaviors and our speech to try to get what we want and to avoid punishment. And again, this is where we end up misrepresenting ourselves. So now, we come by these strategies honestly. I mean, they're really part of our evolutionary development and if you you read you know, and about animals and, the, and animal strategies for survival, it's amazing how many of them in some way are using, um, creating a, a misleading impression in order to make it. So we know the obvious ones, like that viruses camouflage themselves, and we know other creatures camouflage themselves to not be seen just the way we do. We try to conform or be invisible or not make waves so that we don't get in trouble. We know how cats raise their fur to create an impression of being bigger than they are. And we know that humans like Juan in the story have that kind of chip on the shoulder, machismo, whatever. Um, so we, that, those are the most obvious. It's, it's been, it was interesting to me how much mimicry goes on. Uh, we know how we mimic in order to um, be perceived a certain way. Uh, so particularly fish and reptiles, they engage in, uh, there's a lot of female mimicry. This, my favorite story is the garter snake males. So um, they can emit this pheromone that suggests that they're female, but they only do it for a couple of days after they emerge from their winter den. And apparently the goal is to get warm. And garter, the way it happens is garter snakes end up forming this mating balls of a hundred males or, or more around real females. So there's a hundred males around a re- real female. So when this male pretends to be a female, he gets to be at the center of this ball, this mating ball. So he, he's doing it to warm up. And as soon as he's warmed up, he turns off the pheromones and goes back to being a guy. <laughs> but isn't that great, you know, that he's... He's doing it for a hug, you know? (laughs) I think it's so cool. Okay, so there's these, I'll share a few more just because I think they're fascinating. There's an orchid in the Amazon that attracts male flies by mimicking females. In other words, part of the orchid itself looks like a female and the male tries to copulate with this part of the orchid. And when it does, it ends up pollinating the orchid. So that's how the orchid gets pollinated. And then the South American crab spider. I'm reading a book about the Amazon that talks a lot about the Amazon, which where there's so much competition for resources that the strategies are extravagant. They're, you know, it's like unbelievable. So, um, all right, the South American crab spider, it kills an ant, it consumes the ant's body, but leaves the shell intact. It puts the shell over it. It's smaller than an ant. And then by putting the carcass over its own body, it looks like prey and it it's prey, it attracts new victims. So that's just another interesting one. I mean, you've seen the fish and the butterflies that have another, an extra eye, so the attack doesn't happen where their heads are. 
So this is a really major way of protecting and uh, furthering life, is to pretend. So if we feel like, you know, how unethical are we for for lying and misrepresentation, um, that's how we come by it. And the truth is that when you think about it, revealing vulnerability in so many climates actually seems contraindicated. I mean, if you, they've done studies on the kind of face and posturing that political candidates have to have in order to get a certain number of votes. And if people think they're vulnerable, if they don't project a certain competence and machismo and strength and I can dominate, um, they won't get elected. It just won't happen. So, so it's not easy to put down these tools we use of pretending. We know with children that the more threatened they feel, the more they lie to avoid punishment. We do the same. Thomas Sowell wrote, there are only two ways of telling the complete truth, anonymously and posthumously. Now that's a very, it's actually, it's amusing, but it's also very deep. So I want, we're going to come back to this. Anonymously. Well, we can't tell the truth if we're really identified with our separate self-sense. Because telling the truth is undermining to the separate self. The separate self, if it tells the truth, will feel too threatened. So you have to start sensing who you are a little bit beyond that, that egoic self to begin to be free to speak truth. That's the anonymously. And then posthumously, in a similar way, you know, if we're caught in fight-flight, if we're trying to... if we're in that kind of primitive defend-this-life mode, it won't be safe enough. So there really has to be a sense of the possibility of being free from defending life in the moment to begin to really speak truth. Now we're going to, if that sounds abstract, we're going to come back to that. But just to acknowledge that it's, it's part of our karmic situation to have to take care of this particular life, to at times have to defend and pretend. So the inquiry is, well, when do we really get to speak truth? The understanding is that there are many times, and you can, you'll, if you kind of go into some of the inquiry into what the Buddha meant by wise speech, um, he said it's, it's true and it's helpful. And that's a very nuanced understanding. Because there's many things that feel true to us but wouldn't be helpful to say. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's, it, it would be hurtful. The other person would not be in a place to understand or, or work with us on it. Our, there may be something about ourselves that feels very vulnerable and to bring it to the wrong people truly would be undermining ourselves. We'd get hurt. Wouldn't serve. So it's not this blanket thing of, you know, if we're really going to be free, we should always speak truth. And, like so many evolutionary strategies, the degree of defense and pretense that we are adapted to is outmoded. And it's a developmental arrest if we can't wake up from it. We cannot continue in this evolutionary process of awakening consciousness if we spend so much of our time and energy unconsciously perpetrating that behavior of presenting a self. Does that make sense? Let me check around a little. You can nod or you can go like this. I'm, 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 I'm scanning. Okay. In the moments that we're in that role, in a persona, feeling like we need to prove something or cover something, in that moment we cannot perceive who we really are. We're hooked on the ego self and we cannot sense who's looking through, who's, who's there, what is there behind the mask. 
in the moments that we're pretending or defending, we can't sense love. We're disconnected. We can't see who we are. And we intuitively know this. I mean, if you, if you think of a time recently where you were in some way trying to hide something or fluff your resume in some way, and I mean that really broadly, you know, kind of impress or gain respect, we all know that kind of sense of trying to show, show off or show up well. And we're not at home in any sense of real wholeness or there's not a sense of genuineness. And if we contrast that to moments that we're with somebody that where there's a sense of acceptance and safety and we're really just being who we are. We're just resting in a, in a real feeling of truthfulness. The soft spot is exposed. We know that that's when our innocence and our purity and our beingness is more accessible. We know. So how do we begin to more and more cut through that unconscious pretending motion and live for more truthfulness is the inquiry. And the first and biggest step is start to really see when we're living in those strategies. Seeing is freeing. Seeing goes to degrees. You can see it and have a kind of glancing sight of, oh yeah, I was kind of, that was a little fib there. Or you can see and really get, oh, that was coming from this kind of tight, anxious self-sense, fearing not enough, trying to prove, and really sense, oh, and it's just such a small sliver of beingness. And in a way feel that sorrow that we're living inside a part of our being that's so much smaller than the whole. Seeing is freeing. So let's look at the ways that we pretend. Let's just take, take a look at the different uh, ways that we do it. I, I'd say the two main ways that we present ourselves. One is by um, withholding pertinent information. It's what we withhold. And the other one is, is real dis- different degrees of distortion. And you can sense, if you imagine a friend of yours or perhaps your partner, family, where there's not a real sense of closeness, you sense the possibility, but it's not happening, you might ask yourself, you know, what is it that I'm not revealing? What is it I'm not expressing? You know, how am I protecting the soft spot in this relationship? You know what I mean by the soft spot? You know, the places in me that feel insecure or embarrassed or hurting or in some way I'm afraid to have seen. What are we covering? Are we covering that we're feeling depressed a lot and we don't want somebody to know or that we're lonely? Are we covering an addiction? There's a lot of sneaking around addiction that creates distance in relationship. What are we holding back about ourselves because we're afraid of what another will think or we're afraid that they can't handle it or whatever it is we're afraid of that's creating distance. So that's the first inquiry. You know, just to begin to sense that. Now the other level is act- outright distortion. And again, of course, it comes in degrees, misleading. Sometimes we just exaggerate achievements and uh, our exaggerate problems. Or sometimes there's the little fabrications, they call them white lies, I don't even like that expression, but um, there is that statement that when we get into white lies and we, we, we're not conscious of them, we become colorblind. They just, it just becomes a way of life. So are they the fabrications to avoid doing things or to excuse behaviors? How often are we justifying ourselves in some way? Okay. How often do we threaten something to have others, you know, threaten our withdrawal of our affection or some punishment, let's say with children, to get them to cooperate? This is Carol Leifer. She says, whenever I travel, I like to keep the seat next to me empty. I found a great way to do it. When someone walks down the aisle and says to you, is someone sitting there, just say, no one, except the Lord. LAUGHTER 